Thank you, Corey, for that kind introduction, but more importantly, thank you for the great work you're doing leading our Americans for Prosperity Foundation chapter here in New Hampshire. You know, in states across the country, over 35, leaders like Corey Lewandowski are leading our AFP chapters with our 1.8 million grassroots activists. And our goal is pretty simple, to restore economic prosperity to this great nation of ours through limited government, more individual economic freedom, and less government spending and regulation. And Ovid, it's a real honor to be with you. I, look, I know you're a shy, quiet, retiring guy. I know it's tough to come out of your shell, but thank you, brother, for got there and stepping out on that edge. Thank you. Now, one thing about me, and you probably haven't noticed it yet, but I grew up in upstate South Carolina. Uh, there is an overflow room out here with an interpreter. If you want to interpret Southernese, uh, you can do that. Senator DeMint, I know you'll have no problem there. It's great to see my, my home senator and my favorite U.S. Senator, Jim DeMint. Thank you for all you're doing, Senator. Well, tonight we gather for a summit focused on government spending, deficits, debt, and the negative impact they're having on job creation and our prosperity. You know, we're glad to have five potential candidates for the Republican nomination for president with us. And thank you, gentlemen and ladies, for coming very much. And thank you. There are a lot of places you could be this evening, although I hear New Hampshire is pretty popular this time of year. But there are a lot of places you could be, and thank you for sharing this evening with us. Our goal this evening is pretty simple. It's to ask you to detail your stands on economic issues and then the policies you'll pursue uh, if you're fortunate enough to move forward to the next level. Now, you may notice, I know you're stunned to hear this, you may notice that President Obama is not with us this evening. Now, now, that may be surprising to some, given how often the president, for some reason, mentioned Americans for Prosperity, our sister organization, last fall. We thought for sure he would want to come out. But Mr. President, know this. You're welcome to come explain your economic policies before AFP and AFP Foundation audiences any time. We'll give you an open microphone to explain your record. Right? The truth is, though, We've seen clearly where the current presidential administration stands and what they've done. Simply put, when it comes to budget deficits and debt, President Obama's policies are literally bankrupting America. There's no doubt about that. President Obama has increased discretionary spending during his first years by almost 25%. If you include the failed stimulus boondoggle that was $814 billion more, it's over 55% increase in spending in discretionary amounts. I just finished reading a, a brilliant book called Rendezvous with Destiny by Craig Shirley. It's an account, over 600 pages, I guess, of the 1980 presidential race, one that elected a man named Ronald Wilson Reagan. And, and the president... And Ronald Reagan and President Carter were locked in an intense struggle that fall. And the book recounts how the budget deficit numbers for that year came out in the fall. And it was a shock to the entire American political system to hear the amount. Anyone want to know or guess what that amount was in 1980 for the budget deficit for our country? $74 billion. That number shocked the American establishment and Americans. It sounds almost quaint today, doesn't it? Because we use other words now, but the truth is, this president has piled up three, at least with his proposal this year for the budget, it'll be three straight trillion dollar plus budget deficits. The health care policies he's put forward will drive up health care costs for Americans while increasing taxes and spending literally trillions more in years and years to come. Meanwhile, on his watch, Medicare has slipped still further, 
down the road toward fiscal failure. I don't know about you, and maybe we'll have to have a show of hands or maybe just shout it out, I don't know about you, but I think it's the height of hypocrisy for this president to call Paul Ryan and House Republicans, quote, irresponsible for actually trying to do something about the budget deficit. Do you agree with that? Well, the format for this evening is pretty straightforward. We're going to ask our five participants to stick to it. You know, presidential leadership is sometimes, occasionally, about following rules. If we want to get uh, everyone in during the hour and a half, we need to do that tonight and still have a couple of questions for each. But we're going to ask them to stick, each of you to stick to eight minutes with your remarks on uh, revitalizing the economy, government spending, budget deficits, debt, et cetera, job creation. Uh, we'll have some, now, I'm a liberal arts major from Virginia Tech, so we have a high-tech system here. At one minute, you'll see a yellow flashing light. It means caution, right? At, there it is, right there. It's working. Good to know we've got our engineers back there. And at time for each speaker, it'll go red. So we're going to ask our speakers to stay within that. We'll then have two questions on the same economic topics uh, for each, uh, and then uh, that'll be it for the evening. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have the first speaker this evening, and that's Governor Tim Pawlenty from Minnesota. Governor? Thank you. Thank you very much. Or as President Obama would say, you're welcome. <laughs> you had enough of $4 a gallon gas? Yeah. You had enough of unbearable levels of unemployment? You had enough of a federal government that is out of control? Yes. You had enough of Barack Obama? Yes. Yeah, me too. Thank you for being here tonight under the banner of Americans for Prosperity. Ovid, thank you for inviting us and being honored tonight along with Betty for your tremendous work, your role modeling of service, of faith, and family, and dedication, and persistence to this state and the cause of freedom is a clarion call to New Hampshire and to all of America, and we owe you a debt of gratitude. Thank you again, Ovid and Betty. <laughs> Senator DeMint, thank you for your inspiring leadership in the United States Senate. You are uh, a clear voice for common sense, and there's not much of that in Washington, and you're the leader of that in tremendous movement. Thank you, Senator DeMint, for coming tonight. We appreciate that as well. I'm delighted to be here with the other potential candidates in 2012, Michelle Bachman and my good friend Mitt Romney and Herman Cain and Rick Santorum and, and the others. Uh, these are all wonderful people. We're all going to be on the same team because we have the same goal, and that's taking back this country and restoring America to its greatness again. The question before us is about jobs in the economy and government spending. And to answer that question, we should go talk to the people who actually provide the jobs in this country. And when you do, they give you a pretty clear answer every day, all day, real loudly, real clearly, real consistently. And it's not that complicated. And it's this. Get the government off my back. So it varies a little bit by industry or business or employer or sector, but some, of course, are very concerned about taxes being too high. Others are concerned about regulation and the time and expense and delay of getting a permit. Others, of course, are worried about energy costs that are skyrocketing. Others are worried about workers' comp or unemployment insurance comp or unfair uh, rules that tilt the playing field towards the unions. Others are worried about abusive lawsuit systems. But the common message is every time government extends itself and pushes into an area and crowds out an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, a dreamer, a designer, an innovator, somebody who would take a risk, somebody who would start something, grow something, add employees, build buildings, buy equipment, commercialize it, conduct research, do all the things it takes to keep a private sector economy going. Every time government pushes in and takes another piece of that over, they not only grow government, they not only grow budgets, they not only spend more money of your money, but they do something else that's equally corrosive. They discourage the American spirit. Underneath this notion of America's greatness and America's prosperity is what makes us great is that we're free. 
and is fundamentally different than many other cultures around the world, across the globe, and throughout time. We're not the greatest nation the world's ever known because we have the most people in the world. We don't. We need to be more competitive with our cost, but we're clearly not the cheapest place in the world. We're the greatest nation the world's ever known because we're the freest nation in the world. So as government pushes into families and neighborhoods and community and places of worship and private markets and entrepreneurs and discourages them and burdens them down and taxes them and slows them down, we need to push back and say, we're taking our country back. And that's what this campaign in 2012 is all about. Now, many of you know that I talk sometimes about Sam's Club Republicans or Costco or Kmart or Walmart. If you go to a store like that, oftentimes you'll see a mom or a dad with a grocery cart, and they've got a year's supply of Doritos or toilet paper in their cart because of why? They're trying to save a little money because they don't have more money. They're trying to get the best value for the money they do have. They want that from their government as well, and they're not getting it. We've got a government in Washington, D.C., that was fighting recently about whether to spend $3.656 trillion or $3.7 trillion. Problem was, they were only taking in $2.2 trillion. We need to fundamentally change this country. And the spending issue in Minnesota, one of the bluest states in the union, Mitt and I used to debate each other whether Massachusetts or Minnesota was more liberal. But, you know, they voted for Ronald Reagan twice. Minnesota never did. <laughs> We've changed my state. We took spending and brought it below zero for the first budget cycle in 150-year history. <laughs> we cut taxes net over my eight years as governor. We were one of the first states in the country to have performance pay for teachers statewide. We had pension reform. I took one of the largest transit strikes with the bus drivers in the history of the country, shut down the entire transit system for 44 days, had people standing outside my bedroom window with signs saying, Palenti's a weapon of mass transit destruction. <laughs> we did tort reform, welfare reform, all of the things that people talk about now in Minnesota. I share that with you, not to be immodest. But to say, as Frank Sinatra would sing about New York, if we can do it in the land of Mondale and Humphrey and Wellstone and Ventura and now U.S. Senator Al Franken, we can do it anywhere. <laughs> now, it wasn't easy. With all due respect to uh, other folks in public office, some of them need a little encouragement. And back in, pushing them back up against the wall metaphorically matters, and it helps. I had the first government shutdown under my watch in Minnesota in 150-year history of the state. I set a record for vetoes in my state single season and one of the most in history. I unallotted using executive authority more money out of my state's budget in my eight years as governor than all the previous governors in 142 years combined. The Cato Institute, which... The Cato Institute is a libertarian organization. They're tough graders. They gave only four governors in the country an A. They're Louisiana and South Carolina and West Virginia and Minnesota. And I'm proud of that. I just want to share with you the minute I have left. This won't be easy, but working in the mills, as Ovid's relatives did, wasn't easy. Working in the meatpacking plants like many in my hometown did, or driving a truck like my dad did, wasn't easy. And of course, when you see those big plants shut down in Manchester or South St. Paul and the faces of unemployment in your community and the disruption that that causes in your family and your community, you see things not as a budget number, but as a matter of the heart and as a matter of a family and as a matter of a broken future. So my mom died when I was 16. My dad lost his job for a while, not too much after that. So when you're young and your mom passes and your dad's unemployed, you learn some things about hard work and individual responsibility and help and faith and family and love. But we also know that in America, we're strong people. And I bet you with Ovid's relatives, they always saw a brighter future. I see a brighter future for our nation. That's why I'm running for 
president or considering running for president with these guys. <laughs> to be uh, formally and finally announced later. But we'll just say this. That is the secret of this country. We are a hopeful, can-do, optimistic, let's get it done group of people. We're not about thinking China's going to lead the world or we're going to be in second or third or fourth place. America's place is to lead the world in everything. Now let's go do it and take back our country. Thank you very much. Governor, uh, a, a decade ago, federal outlays were at $1.8 trillion. Today, they're more than double that. Uh, what are some of the specific policies that you would pursue to get this spending imbalance under control? And wouldn't it have to include entitlement reform of some sort, uh, especially with Medicare? Sure. That's the real question. Of course, if you look at the federal outlays of about $3.7 trillion and a pie chart of federal spending, looking at the red part of the pie chart being the mandatory or autopilot spending. It's Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, interest on the national debt. That red part of the pie chart is already over the halfway line, and at the rate at which it's growing, it's soon going to be over the three-quarter line. And most of the rest of the pie chart, the blue part, is defense. So if you believe what I believe about defense, which is we shouldn't cut it, now there's some efficiencies we can have and redeploy it back into defense, then the real answer to, this, to the problem, to the challenge, lies in the red part of the pie chart. And the bulk of that, of course, is the entitlement programs. I believe we need to look the American people in the eye and tell them the truth, speak plainly and simply and boldly and courageously about the challenges that we're in. Don't scare them and freak them out, but show them the solutions in the way forward. So here's what I propose. In Social Security, it's time to say to the American people for new or newer entrance into the program, new entrance into the program, because life expectancies are increasing, we're going to gradually increase the retirement age over time for new entrance into Social Security. We have to do it, and I think we can get the bulk of America to agree to that. Secondly, I don't like means testing as a philosophical matter, but given the choices that we have in front of us, I think we have to do at least this as it relates to the cost of living adjustment in Social Security, not the whole program, just the cost of living adjustment, it's time we look the American people in the eye and say, if you're wealthy, you're not going to get as big of a cost of living adjustment as if you're middle income or lower uh, uh, income. Those two things will send a powerful signal to the world, to the markets, to our country that we can solve our problems and get these programs back on track, and I believe we can get a majority of the country to embrace that. On Medicare, and Medicaid, I believe we should do what Paul Ryan has suggested on Medicaid, uh, cap it at a level that we can afford, block grant the whole thing to the laboratories of democracies, the states. And Medicare is a longer answer, but two, two things to note in particular amongst many things that need to be done. One is we can't have a 1950 system that pays providers based on historical costs without regard to results or quality. So we have to align the money to the results that we want. And two, we have to have people have some skin in the game in terms of being in charge of their own health care, being in charge of making choices for what's best for them and their family not having a centralized system run out of Washington, D.C. with limited or no choices, top-down command and control, inefficient, and really financially insolvent. Okay, thank you. And the last question. Thank you, Governor. <laughs> Governor, as you may know, New Hampshire's House recently passed legislation that would allow New Hampshire to pull out of the REGI system, which is a cap-and-trade style energy tax. Um, as governor of Minnesota, you supported something that was similar in the early 2000s, I think, on this issue. Uh, have you changed your views and approach to this issue, and if so, how? Yes. Uh, a couple of years ago, after considering a cap and trade in Minnesota or regionally, mm -hmm. and, and uh, considering it, I changed my position and said it was a mistake, uh, I, it was stupid, and I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Can't be more the direct than that. It is ham-fisted, and this is a couple, I think, probably two or three years ago in a letter and other communications to the Congress uh, said, look, I no longer have that position. 
It will be detrimental to the economy, destructive to the economy, ham-fisted. It's wrongly directed, uh, wrong directionally, wrong philosophically. So I don't try to defend it. Everybody's got a couple of clunkers in their record. I just say, that's one of mine. I'm sorry. It was a mistake. It was dumb. Thank you. Thank all you, right. Governor. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Our second speaker this evening uh, is Senator Rick Santorum from the great state of Pennsylvania. Please give him a good welcome. Thank you very much, Jim. I uh, am honored to be here again uh, in New Hampshire. It's, uh, it's, I think, my 15th trip to New Hampshire in the past, uh, in the past year. I just came from uh, my hometown of Pittsburgh, where I spoke at the NRA convention. And I uh, uh, wanted to, uh, to welcome the folks to Pittsburgh, and uh, I wanted to, uh, to speak to the NRA, because throughout my time in the Congress, one of the things that um, the NRA is always focused on, in fact, I'm a, I'm a member of the NRA, and I get their magazine. And the magazine is called Freedom. Freedom. If you think about it, if you think about what is at the core, as Ovid talked about earlier, what's at the core of what motivates me, because the questions are asked, you know, well, what would your plans be? Well, the plan has to be, well, what is the core value that makes America different than every other country in the history of the world? What made our economy more successful? What made our society more successful? And it comes down to the document that is the why for America. The Constitution is the how. How does America operate? But the why of America lies in the Declaration of Independence, those words that Ovid talked about earlier that is on the lips of every American, or at least used to be, before our education system got to our children. And that is that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Our founders understood Our founders understood that's the why. And what is that why? Is it an economic understanding of the world? No. No. It's a moral understanding. America is a moral enterprise that says that all of us are created equal. Why? Because is Jack equal to Betty? No. Are they the same? No. Are they equal in any objective way? Probably not. So what? Well, she's cuter. Yes, over. That's true. But why is she equal? Because she is equal in the eyes of God to Jack and everybody else. See, our founders understood that America, if it was going to be a prosperous and great nation, had to have a, a why that held us together. And the why was that we are equal and that we have rights from God given to us, and that the government's role, very clearly, was to be limited for the one thing. One of my favorite movies is City Slickers. <laughs> the one thing, the one thing of America, the whole purpose of America, is to keep you free so you can provide for yourself, your family, the people you love, and the God you serve. That is the why of America. You want to know what holds us together? What, why my grandfather came to this country even though he lived in a beautiful area, had a secure job, but he had Benito Mussolini who were telling him that his children had to get up in the morning and dress in brown shirts and march every day. And he said, no, I'll give up that security that the government will provide for me. And I'll come and I'll work until he's 72 years old in the coal mines of western Pennsylvania. He sacrificed just like every generation of Americans, stories like Ovid's and Tim's and so many others that made sacrifices for the one thing. And ladies and gentlemen, that one thing is why people are so animated across America because that one thing is at stake in this election. The President of the United States two weeks ago said something that every person in this room should know and repeat over and over again. It's chilling. It's descriptive of what the problem is that's confronting America through this administration. He said in his budget retort to Paul Ryan, he talked about the wonders of Medicare, Medicaid, and unemployment insurance. And he said this, 
America is a better country because of those policies. Fine. Okay, fine. But then he said this. I'll go one step further. America was not a great country until those programs. Can you imagine the president of this country saying America was not a great country prior to 1965? America was founded great. It wasn't great because some politicians gave us stuff. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if we want to revive this economy, we want to revive this nation. You want to know what motivates me? It's what Jim DeMint's book was about, freedom. It's about freedom of, and trust in the American people. Trusting that each and every one of you, by serving your God and providing for yourselves and your families, and yes, being your brother's keeper in your community, collectively, we can do much better than a group of people in Washington, D.C. designing things for us. What we see, this huge budget deficit, this huge burden that we have laid on the economy of this country is as a result of people in Washington thinking they know better and that they trust themselves more than they trust you. Obamacare is simply about a man who believes that he is caring for you if he designs a health care system that provides not for people on the margins of society, but for every man and woman in America. That's caring in his mind. That is not caring. That is trying to manipulate every man and woman to do what you want them to do, and that is not America. So what would I do to get this economy going again? I would first and foremost repeal Obamacare. First and foremost out of the box. I would cut taxes and cut taxes on people who create jobs in America, incentivize corporations to keep their employment here in this country by, by cutting corporate taxes. Those are the kinds of things we have to do. Again, trusting, trusting you, trusting you, trusting the American people to do what is right. We also need an energy policy. Look at what is going on in our country today with these huge gas prices. And here's what the President of the United States said. He, he mocked Sarah Palin and John McCain and others from the last election who were talking about drill, baby, drill. He said, that's not the answer. No, the answer is we need to, do, to conserve. We need to use less. We need all these new technologies to conserve and use less liquid fuels. Does the President really think you are that stupid? Think about what he said. The answer is not supply, it's just demand. Any basic economics class says there's two ways in which you can affect price. Supply and demand. And under the presence world, there's only one. He does believe you're that stupid. Well, let me tell you what's going on right now in America. When I left the United States Senate, we were fighting over building LNG terminals on the east coast of the country. Why? Because we didn't have enough natural gas. Well, during that time, we found something in Pennsylvania and in New York called Marcella Shale, the largest natural gas find in the history of the country. And guess what we're doing with those LNG terminals? We're exporting natural gas. Why? Drill, baby, drill. Hey. You want to lower, lower costs? The reason, and I'm almost done, the reason... <laughs> I'll be very quick with my answers to the question. The reason that we're seeing gasoline prices high is because, not because there's a short of gasoline, it's because there's uncertainty as where that gasoline's coming from. We need to make sure that gasoline's coming from here and those prices will come down. You didn't get my big clothes, but that's, that's what you're gonna have to do. Well, Senator, uh, the administration has been pursuing a, a regulatory uh, assault uh, on Americans, families, businesses that they really can't get through Congress. They're using the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Labor Relations Board, 
other agencies to pursue their agenda. Uh, as president, what would you do about this assault from a regulatory perspective and, and rolling it back? Uh, and specifically, would you call for legislation that says Congress has to approve regulations that cost beyond a certain dollar amount? Uh, we have all sorts of regulatory review procedures already in, in the Congress. Uh, but I, look, the, the heart of the problem of regulations is passing laws, and Jim talks about this, is passing laws that are these huge expansive bills that provide enormous flexibility for regulators to do incredible amounts of mischief. So the problem is the Congress. It's not the, I, I mean, the president is using the authority that the Congress is giving to him. You look at the Obamacare bill, and I think there's 700 times the words, the secretary shall appears in that bill. You're giving power away from the people who were elected to actually make decisions about how government should operate, and you're yielding them to the executive branch and, and more, worse yet, to the bureaucracies within that branch. And so the, be the best answer to this is not to mess around with the regulatory system, but let's get back to simpler bills, no, no big three, four, five, six thousand page bills, but talk about getting simple bills that actually Congre force Congress to make decisions. When the LN NLRB, you know, you know, what's an unfair labor practice? Well, read, the NL read that law. You, you have no idea what an unfair labor practice right. is. So let's get Congress back to the job of actually articulating what the law should be and not yielding that authority over to the executive branch. Okay. Yeah. Senator Tom Coburn has called earmarks a gateway drug to bigger spending. Yeah, I've got some lines. <laughs> so. And uh, they've helped explode spending. Yeah. Even when Republicans are in charge, they dramatically increased. I know you supported earmarks when you were in the Senate. That's why I talked about my line <laughs> and my arm. Man. Has your view of these earmarks changed, and where would you go policy-wise if you were president? Well, Jim DeMint, uh, now he doesn't have nearly the tracks in his arm that I did. I, I will say that. But... Uh, look, when I was in I was in Congress, I had a, I had a very clear clear. I came into the United States Senate with Bill Clinton in charge of, of of the presidency, and on a variety of issues, I did not like the way the president was spending money. So I I aggressively earmarked money so I would we would spend money in areas that otherwise the president would not have spent, and and I I think you you make a legitimate argument that that got out of control and it led to uh, larger and larger increases of spending. And uh, thanks to, again, the good counsel of my friend Jim DeMint, uh, I think it is we, we owe the American public cold turkey on this. We owe them that this is not something we were going to do. But, but I think it's very important to, to also say that, you know, we need to have, if we're going to do that, then we need to have a lot more aggressive oversight on what the administration is spending the money on. Because when you don't, when you get rid of earmarks, you, you give that authority over to the, to, the, to the executive to do. And so I, I think congressional oversight is, is vitally important uh, if we're going to do that. But I, I have, I have uh, said that earmarks are a bad thing. But again, I, it's, a very it's a very easy thing for someone who's thinking about, Tim, thinking about running for president <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to say that you swear <laughs> off earmarks because earmarks are Congress and not the president. So if you swear off earmarks, that means actually the president gets to spend more money. So, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. And I think Jim and, and the folks who have, who, have, who have been advocating for this uh, rightly point out that it is a corrupting influence uh, in, the, uh, in the appropriations process. It has led to more spending, and it's something we should get rid of. Senator Rick Santorum. Thank you very much. And our third participant is Governor Mitt Romney from Massachusetts. Governor. Thank you, my friends. Good to see so many people this evening. Great to have you here. Thank you, Ovid, for your great service to this great state and to our nation. Uh, thank you also, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for those that have come from uh, outside the state to join us this evening. What a week this has been, uh, from one extreme to the other. Our hearts squat to the people in the South who were affected by that terrible series of tornadoes. Uh, this morning, great excitement as we saw a wedding across the pond. And, uh, and there was big political news this week. Uh, the president finally produced a long-form birth certificate. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there was no one more disappointed than that amiable, know-it-all windbag, Joe Biden. <laughs> we wish Joe Biden well. 
Now, I want to thank you in New Hampshire for the role that you play, a critical role in assessing who ought to be our nominee and who the next president ought to be. And, uh, and that's a role which is special because you put so much attention and, and involvement in the, uh, in the selection of individuals and pay so much attention to them. I appreciate that. The nation does. And, and because of your special role, I want to tell you a bit about why Ann and I are back talking to you about a presidential run. And I'm going to begin with family and values. My, uh, my dad, you don't know a lot about. He grew up poor, actually. You know, he was governor later in life, but he grew up poor. His dad went broke multiple times. He was a lath and plaster carpenter as a young man. And then on his honeymoon, to pay for the hotels and gas, he sold aluminum paint from the trunk of the car. But he believed in America. And even though he didn't have a college degree, he believed in an America where a lath and plaster guy could grow up to become head of a big car company and could become governor of one of the states where he'd sold aluminum paint on his honeymoon. Now, Dad taught me values. He taught me the value of hard work. He taught me the value of family and faith and their preeminence in my life. He taught me to care for other people. And he taught me a profound and abiding love for the United States of America. As my career began, I, uh, I got involved in business, as you know. And uh, as a result of the business I started, or helped to start, I was involved with some startup businesses and then ultimately some very large businesses, some in trouble, sometimes they're successful, sometimes not. But one thing I learned was how jobs grow in this country and how they go elsewhere and how you compete with other countries. And I learned how you can try and make America a more competitive place with more jobs to grow. That's why it's broken my heart to watch this president who has no experience in the private sector, never worked in a, in, in, in a business at a job that you're working in, has no experience in leadership, and then he took the reins of the country at the time the economy was going down. And, and as a result, he says, well, he, did, he just inherited the downturn. Yeah, that's right, but he made it worse, and he made it deeper and longer. It's three years now. We have 20 million Americans out of work or underemployed or have given up looking for work. We have people who don't know how they can make ends meet because of the cost of gasoline and the higher cost of food. It is simply inexcusable. He could have learned better. He came to New Hampshire. Look, he, he saw the mills in Manchester. He saw the buildings. He recognized that there was an economic crisis here. He could have learned that when you dealt with that economic crisis, you believed in holding down taxes, keeping regulations low, balancing budgets, keeping government small. And that formula has filled those mill buildings. And now New Hampshire is a capital of, of innovation and small business. But he didn't look to New Hampshire. Instead, he looked to Europe. He looked to Europe. And what he saw over there is when their, their economies got in trouble, that they spent more money and borrowed more money. So that's what he did. And when they saw that their health care system was in trouble, he had the federal government take it, took it over. That's what he did. And then, of course, when energy prices were high over there, the solution was higher energy prices with cap and trade. And then he also uh, looked at labor regulations and said, you know what, we need to tilt the playing field much more in favor of labor. All the things he did, you look at them one by one, are just like the Europeans did. And Europe doesn't work there. And it sure as heck is not going to work here. He got it wrong. Don't look to Europe. Look to America. I believe in America. I believe in the American experiment. We got it right. They got it wrong. When, when the founders spoke of freedom and opportunity, think of the choices that they made. They could have fashioned our declaration and our constitution to, uh, to put in place a strong central government or a king to tell us what to do and how to do it. But instead, they said, no, we're not only going to let the American people select their representatives. We're going to let the American people choose their course in life. And by virtue of that choice, America became the place on the planet where every person seeking opportunity, every pioneer, every freedom lover wanted to come here. Circumstance of birth was no barrier to what we could accomplish. And so they came here by the millions. Even those who came here involuntarily as slaves had to overcome prejudice and bias in order to become part of the, the American dream. And they did so and became champions in doing it. It is who we are. We're pioneers, freedom lovers, freedom seekers, innovators, champions. And we are not going to let Barack Obama or the Democrats or the liberals take that away from America. I believe in free enterprise and capitalism. How many people in here, you or your spouse, work in a business, in the private sector, 
Almost everybody. I don't think the president likes you. I do like you. I like the jobs that you create. I know what it takes to make more good jobs. I believe in small government. America believes in small government. We're spending too much money. We got to cap how much money we spend at the federal government level at 19% of GDP or lower. Cap the spending and cap the regulations as well. We Americans are a patriotic people. I believe in the love which we have for this great country. I have seen it as I got, got across the country and seen the passion and, and, and fervor that people have for this great land. Uh, when I had the, the fun of helping organize the Olympic Winter Games, I, uh, I noticed that the athletes from America, when we got the gold medal, they, uh, they put their hand over their heart as the national anthem was played. No other young people from around the world did that that I could notice. I wonder where that tradition began. I understand it began under FDR, who during the Second World War asked the American people to put their hand over their heart during the playing of the national anthem as a sign of respect and admiration and love for those who had lost their lives, who shed their blood in behalf of liberty, for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. This is a great country. America's greatness is being challenged by those who would make us more like Europe or like some other place. The right answer for America is not to turn elsewhere, it's to turn northward to New Hampshire and other great states that understand the principles of freedom and opportunity and free enterprise and capitalism and small government and federalism and the Constitution. This is a great land. God has blessed America. He is blessed in part because great people have adhered to principles that are eternal in nature. We will hold fast to those principles that make America, America. And by doing so, we'll provide for our next generations with freedom and prosperity in a land that our God will be proud to call his own. Thank you so much. Great to be with you tonight. Governor, on the first day of the current administration, the, the price of a gallon of gas was $1.83. It's doubled basically wow. since then. Wow. A dollar eighty three. Dollar eighty three. And it's not just gasoline, but utility bills as well that are going up. Uh, what policies would you pursue to bring down these energy prices that are hurting businesses and families? I, I just can't help but uh, notice that uh, you remember during the, the Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter uh, debates that Ronald Reagan came up with this great thing about the misery index and, and that he hung that around Jimmy Carter's neck and, and that had a lot to do with Jimmy Carter losing. Well, we're going to have to hang the Obama misery index around his neck. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you, the, the, fact, the fact that you've got people in this country really squeezed with gasoline getting so expensive, with commodities getting so expensive, families are having a hard time making ends meet. So we're going to have to talk about that and, and housing foreclosures and bankruptcies and higher taxation. We're going to hang him with that, uh, so to speak, <laughs> metaphorically, with, uh, uh, with uh, you have to be careful these days. I learned that. With that Obama misery index. Now, what do you do about energy prices? All right. We're not going to change them overnight. He'd like to find a scapegoat. By the way, you notice any time the president has an area of concern, he tries to find someone to blame. Uh, we're going to have an investigation and to see if there's price gouging going on. Mr. President, the reason gasoline prices are so high is we don't have enough oil, and we haven't drilled for it in this country, and we haven't put in place resources to use the natural gas that Rick Santorum just spoke about. That's what the reason is. And so if you want to see gasoline prices brought down, you have to increase supply. Now, some would say, but that would take years to, to, to come about. But you know something about how pricing works. When, when, when prices are set, they look not only at the supply and demand today, but their expectation of future supply and demand. And if we start drilling and use our natural gas, which has suddenly become in massive abundance, and use our oil and our coal, as well as our renewable resources, we can change the equation in supply and demand long term and finally begin to bring that balance into a, a point where, where prices can be affected. And by the way, one more thing. If we're going to spend a lot for energy, Let's spend it here at home. Let's not spend yeah. send a half a trillion dollars to bad guys around the world. That's right. That's right. Governor, given the benefit of hindsight, would you still sign the health care bill that you signed into law when you were governor of Massachusetts? I was hoping I'd get that question. Good. <laughs> and good. share your reasoning with yeah, us good. if you would. Thank you. Thank you. It's about time. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, in my state, like in most states, 
there are a lot of problems in health care. Uh, you got people who, if they change jobs, lose insurance and can't get reinsured. You got people who have pre existing conditions that can't get insurance. You have something else you uh, are concerned about people that don't have insurance at all. And, and then there's some folks who, who show up at a hospital with, let's say, a heart attack or come from an automobile accident and they rack up huge bills $100,000 bill, $200,000 bill. They don't have any insurance. And guess who they expect to pay? You, the taxpayers. In my state, we were spending hundreds of millions of dollars giving out free care to people who could have afforded to take care of themselves. And so I went to work to try and solve a problem. And it may not be perfect. By the way, it is not perfect. Some parts of that experiment worked. Some parts didn't. Some things I'd change. One thing I'd never do, by the way, would be to impose a one-size-fits-all plan like Obamacare on the nation. That's simply wrong and unconstitutional. And it won't work. And, and I like how the president wants to... Uh, You, you, you will note that he and the Democrats want to constantly give me credit for their plan. Uh, uh, you, you know what there's method of their madness, but let me tell you this. If and when I have the occasion to debate President Obama, I, I'm going to ask him this question. Mr. President, why didn't you call me and ask how it worked? <laughs> ours, ours is an experiment. Some parts didn't work. His plan will not work. It will bankrupt us. It is absolutely wrong. It's unconstitutional. It's bad policy. It's bad for America's families. And on, I, I, of course, will fight to, to repeal Obamacare. But on day one, if I were President of the United States, on day one, I would instruct the Secretary of Health and Human Services to grant a waiver from Obamacare to all 50 states. Here, here. Here, here. Thank, you. Thank you. Governor Mitt Romney. Next, businessman Herman Cain from Georgia. Welcome, Herman. Thank you. Congratulations to Ovid. Congratulations to the people of the Granite State for flipping this state, which shows that we the people are still in charge of this country. Thank you for doing that. Let it be borne in mind that the tragedy of life does not lie in not reaching your goals. The tragedy lies in having no goals to reach for. It's not a calamity to die with dreams unfulfilled, but it is a calamity to have no dreams. The American dream is under attack. The American dream is under attack because of too much legislation, too much regulation, and too much taxation. But that's good news. We can take it back, and we've already started to take back the American dream. Step number one in taking back the American dream is to stimulate this economy. It's real simple. Jobs, jobs jobs will help to restore the American dream to millions of people who are giving up hope. One of the first things I would ask this Congress to do in order to stimulate this economy with direct stimulus, not more government spending, number one, lower the corporate tax rate from 35 to 25 percent. We are the only nation on the planet that has not done it in the last 15 years and also lower personal income tax rates because this may come as a surprise to the liberals. When people keep more of what they earn and businesses keep more of what they earn, the economy grows. You take it out of the government hands and you put it in the people's hands. <laughs> Number two, take the capital gains tax rate to zero. That's gonna drive the liberals crazy, but take it to zero. The liberals want to argue, well, you're just rewarding the rich. No, you're not. You're stimulating investment in this country. Lowering taxes is not in their DNA, but if we take this message to the American people and they understand how it's going to stimulate the economy, I believe that we will be able to get the people to support it. Number three, repatriated profits. Take it to zero. They're not coming home anyway. This is low-hanging fruit. We've got nearly a trillion dollars off offshore that's not coming home because the liberals want to tax it. Take it to zero. Number four, 
let's give workers and employers a real payroll tax holiday. Not this little crumb that they threw out of lowering it a couple of percent. I believe that we can lower the payroll tax for every worker in America, 6.2% for a year, every employer for America, the full 6.2%. Let's give every worker in America a raise of 6.2% for a year, and I guarantee you that this economy will be growing at a bigger rate than it is growing now. Now, the liberals are going to say, well, how are you going to pay for it? It pays for itself. If they would stop long enough and look at history over the last 100 years, proper tax cuts pay for themselves. We've simply got to educate the American public on that fact and not the fact that tax cuts cost money. Number five, and most importantly, in my five-point plan, after you make those changes, make the tax rates permanent. Uncertainty is killing investment in this country. Make them permanent. And by putting more of the mo people's money back in the hands of the people, we will get government out of the business as a start of picking winners and losers. Government's role is not to pick winners and losers. Government's role is to make sure that they provide the environment for businesses to thrive and not just survive. Spending. Let's start with repeal and replacement of Obamacare from a government-centered program to a patient-centered program. Ideas are already on the table. All we have to do is take those ideas and pass it with the right leadership. Spending. Three words. Cut, cut, cut. I can think of a few agencies in Washington, D.C., that might need to be cut all the way to the bone. I don't believe in unfunded mandates. I believe, as Representative Ryan has, has talked about, if we are going to send money to the states, let's block grant it. And if I were President of the United States, I would use the same approach that I used when I took over some failing companies that were going broke. You do an across-the-board cut of about 10%. Then you do a, do a deep drive. Mitt has done the same thing many times with businesses. Then you do a deep dive. That means that the CEO has to sit down with the new agency head and find those programs that are overlapping or duplicative or they don't do anything anymore. Too many programs in Washington, D.C. simply just die on the vine and we keep paying for them like Amtrak. But the only way that we are going to seriously cut is to restructure those programs like Social Security. That's where I would start. I would use the Chilean model with a personal retirement account option. Now, the liberals are going to try to demagogue it and say, you're trying to privatize Social Security and take away the benefits for old people, puppy dogs, and kids. This is how they generally try to demagogue stuff. The small country of Chile did it 30 years ago. They fixed their problem. I believe with the right leadership, we can also fix ours. Now, here's why I believe we can do this, folks. We've got to have the right leadership in the White House. And I believe if you've got the right leader in the White House that understands what I call common sense solutions, we can do this. And here's why. If you get past that line in that great document, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, You'll find some more words, as I told a caller one night. If any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. We've got some altering and abolishing to do. And so I believe we can do this because we the people are still in charge of this country. The second reason that I believe we can do it is because this sleeping giant called We the People, the Tea Party movement, the Citizens Movement, whatever you want to call it, this sleeping giant has awakened and is not going back to sleep. This is why I believe we will be able to do this. Now, that being said, it's not going to be easy. It wasn't easy for the Granite State to turn this state. It's not going to be easy for us to take back our government. But I believe that we can. My grandfather was a small farmer 
all of his life. My grandfather used to take a wagon load of potatoes into town. He didn't drive down the smooth center part of the road. Grandpa would always drive on the rough part of the dirt road. And so I asked my grandfather one day, Grandpa, why do you drive with those mules pulling the wagon on the rough part of the road? He said, that way, by the time we get to town, all of the little potatoes will be on the bottom and all of the big potatoes will be on the top. We are the big potatoes and we can take back our country. Be a big potato. Mr. Kane, do you support a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution? And if so, what provisions would you need to see in it specifically? Yes, I support a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> the provision in it should be real simple. Every year, the United States Congress could not spend more than we take in. It's really simple. And if we have a thriving economy by stimulating it with direct stimulus, we won't have a revenue problem. And it'll be easier for us to be able to balance our budget every year. Mr. King, businesses often support corporate welfare in the form of taxpayer subsidies. I'm thinking of the biofuel industry, which gets around $6 billion a year, uh, while decrying other forms of welfare. Uh, would you support ending taxpayer subsidies for businesses and corporations? I can tell you from my experience serving on several corporate boards for the last 20 years, businesses would very quickly trade giving up any sort of subsidies and what some people call corporate welfare in exchange for less regulation. How about taking Sarbanes-Oxley and starting all over again? Yeah. How about taking some of the other regulations that are costing yeah. businesses money and start over again? One of the things that I would do is to put together what I call a regulatory reduction commission. For example, for the EPA. And the people that I would appoint to that commission would be everybody that has been abused by the EPA. <laughs> Mr. Herman Cain. Please welcome Congresswoman Michelle Bachman from Minnesota. are a little more height challenged in the room. Thank you everyone for the warm, wonderful invitation to join all of you this evening here in the Live Free or Die State. It is an honor for me to be able to be here and an, it's an august group. You are the embodiment of where this country is going. You proved it in the last election. We're extremely proud of you and this is the core and the nucleus of that movement here in this room. So I want to thank you and Ovid, you're the leader of the band in all of this. So thank you for what you've done. Just before the last election, when all of us were working so hard to change the composition, not only here in the Granite State, but also in the House of Representatives in Washington and into the Senate of the United States, it looked like we had a really good shot to take the House and maybe even take the Senate. And I got to thinking, and I sat down with my pen and paper, because I wanted to write down what would we do if we actually were able to get the gavels? What would we do? And so I hope you'll indulge me, because I want to read to you what I wrote down about what we could do. Imagine a stable economic and political environment where a job creator could go to bed at night assured that the rules of the game their business runs by will remain the same in the foreseeable future. Imagine if the federal government announced the following tomorrow. 
a 25% cut in federal government discretionary spending. That was about the amount that President Obama increased spending by in just his first few months in office. Then we cancel the outstanding stimulus that works so well, you know. You cancel the outstanding stimulus funds and you return the repaid TARP funds to the United States Treasury. Then we would reinstate the 1994 Welfare Reform Act with a lifetime cap of five years. If you may not know, that was one of the first things Speaker Pelosi did. She got rid of what worked so well to reform welfare. She got rid of that act. We need to put that back into place. A balanced budget proposed and passed this year with no tax increases and a commitment to no increased spending beyond population growth plus inflation. Then imagine the federal government would send a letter to every state and local government announcing it will not now or not ever bail out any underfunded public employee pension plan or health care plan. Thank you, Governor Walker. The federal government would then announce the same to private businesses, both unionized and non-unionized. In other words, Uncle Sam would officially declare himself out of the financial backstop business. That would include telling Wall Street investors that they've seen the last of federal bailouts. Get used to it. The dice that Wall Street rolls would be theirs to deal with it, so price your risk accordingly. Next, Uncle Sam would declare he's getting out of running and owning private businesses. Start with Freddie and Fannie. Yeah. These failed nationalized mortgage monstrosities would be put on an auction block and sold to the highest bidder. Minimum bid, 50 cents. The federal government would legalize competition in the mortgage industry by ending future federally backed mortgage subsidies. And Congress would sell government share in AIG, the largest insurance company in America, as well as Chrysler and GM, Bank of America, and Citibank. It's time to get out of the private industry. <laughs> Uncle Sam would then legalize private student lending, imagine that, and end the federal government's invol involvement. And Obamacare and all its ugly, expensive tentacles would be repealed. And in its place, Congress would allow Americans to purchase any health insurance policy they want in any state they want with no minimum mandates using your own tax-free dollars fully allowing all Americans to de deduct their costs on their individual tax return, plus full tort reform. That's it. You can get that all done in about 18 pages, and we're there. The EPA would then be subject to a full review and would downsize to a mission focused only on conservation of safe air, land, and water. No cap and trade, not now, not ever. Congress would then legalize American energy production in natural gas, clean coal, nuclear, hydro, petroleum, wind, solar. Heck, hamsters running on a cage. What do we care? All of it. All with public safety requirements and all without federal subsidy. With spending reduced and Uncle Sam getting out of owning and controlling private industry, then Congress would create a pro-growth economy by cutting the business tax rate down from the highest in the world at 34% down to 9% or about the lowest in the industrialized world. Zero out capital gains, zero out the death tax, and zero out alternative minimum tax, and increase Section 179 expensing to 100% in the year of purchase. All marginal personal income tax rates would be no higher than 20%. In fact, we could simplify this even a little further. We could take the federal tax code, and I'm a United States federal tax attorney, all 3.8 million words, we could scrap that thing all together as far as I'm concerned and adopt a national consumption tax. Some call it a fair tax. And as far as I'm concerned, a fair tax or a flat tax, let's get rid of what we've got and start over. Finally, I would have Congress pass a mother of all repeal bills to essentially repeal the last four years of Pelosi, Reid, and Obama. Yeah. 
That would be a pleasure, their job-killing agenda. And just like the Democrats saved their big spending, big government pet projects for full funding in the failed trillion-dollar stimulus program, so true should pro-growth Republicans pass a massive repeal bill that does away with government rules and regulations that kill American job growth. And in my opinion, that should take committed constitutional conservatives about a long weekend to get it done. <laughs> if we're really, if we're really, drink your energy drink and away we go. Here's the upside. Imagine certainty. Imagine downsizing government. Imagine assurance of future limited government. And imagine government no longer owning private businesses. Imagine legalizing new business opportunities. Imagine competitive tax rates. Imagine the freedom to succeed. We can do this. It really isn't that hard to, for uncle to put his house in order. And this dream can be our reality in less than two years if we win the triple crown of the House, the Senate, and the White House. I know it can happen. And speaking of a better life, I fought with everything that was in me in Congress against Obamacare. I called for it, and tens of thousands of patriots, some of you in this room, answered the call. You responded by coming down to Washington, D.C. to fight against socialized medicine. And I want you to know, I am committed to not resting until Obamacare is finally repealed. And it will happen. It will happen. Don't give up hope. And here's why I know it will happen, because it's American ingenuity that has given us the greatest nation on earth. Just let me end with this one story, polio. Polio was a killer. It not only devastated children and adults, it devastated our economy. But a private charity, March of Dimes, working together with, uh, with other organizations, were able to bring about the immunization by Jonas Salk. It changed the course of history. America has done that all throughout history, and we can do that again, whether it's energy, whether it's health care. You name the subject. We're capable. We just get our house in order. Thank you, Tim. Congresswoman, if the, the votes were not in place uh, as, as president to repeal uh, Obamacare fully. Uh, what steps could you take that would be most effective in rolling it back to the fullest extent possible until the votes were there to fully repeal it? Right now, what we should be doing is fully defunding Obamacare. If we can't repeal it, we shouldn't give one dime to put this Frankenstein into place. That's something that the House of Representatives can do. Because remember, President Obama doesn't have access, Harry Reid doesn't have access to one dime of your money unless and until the House of Representatives authorizes that money. If you have conservatives in charge of the House of Representatives, why in the world would we give even one dime to inflate this monster? That's where we have power. That's where we need to stand. That's the line in the sand that we have to draw right now to defund Obamacare. Here, here. Our nation's debt limit now stands at $14.3 trillion, and we're about to exceed it. Uh, what should be done this summer when the limit is reached? My opinion is that we should not increase the debt ceiling. I think that the... I believe what we have to do, number one, is stand for the full faith and credit of the United States of America. We have a bill that is being sponsored by Senator Pat Toomey and also by Representative Tom McClintock, and it says this. It directs Tim Geithner, our Treasury Secretary, who had a little tax problem of his own, if you might remember, <laughs> to tell him that he is mandated to first pay off all debts of the United States, all interest, all obligations, so we don't put that all-important full faith and credit of the United States at risk. I am just here to tell you, as all of you in this room, I, I believe, would agree, we're in trouble now. Not 10 years from now. Not five years from now. We're in deep trouble now. And you cannot allow us to continue to go on in the United States Congress and spend money that we don't have. 
we're paying a price for this now. And so what we have to do is have a very real conversation today with every segment of our population, young, old, black, white, poor, rich, all of us, because we're all Americans. We're all in this together. And we have to have a conversation today about why this year we should look seriously at how we're going to balance our budget this year. Have those conversations this year about Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, discretionary spending, non-discretionary spending. Have it this year. Our nation is capable of this conversation. The American people aren't children. They're adults. They love this country. I come from a state in Minnesota where on our birth certificate, and I do have one, Generally speaking, they stamp Democrat on your birth certificate in our state. And I grew up in a Democrat household. But we were reasonable, fair-minded people. And one thing I know about a lot of people who are independents and Democrats and apolitical people, they are reasonable, fair-minded people. If we lay out where we're at right now in the United States, I believe in reasonable, fair-minded Americans wanting to vote that this country goes on. I do, you do, and I think most Americans will vote that this country goes on. Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. Thank you. Well, I want you to take note of this, ladies and gentlemen. Five potential candidates for the Republican nomination, five speeches, two questions to each, other things, and we're finishing 12 minutes ahead of schedule, all right? So give them a hand, by the way. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. And let's make sure as the next year unfolds, we have the most direct conversation possible about the economic future of our country. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome back up our host for the evening, our state director here in New Hampshire for Americans for Prosperity, Corey Lewandowski. I'm a little taller than the congresswoman. One, I want to remind everyone why we came tonight, and first and foremost, that was to honor a native son of New Hampshire, Ovid LaMontagne, as Conservative of the Year. Thank you, Ovid. <laughs> Secondly, I'd also like to thank the potential presidential candidates for adhering to our very complex lighting system of red, green, and uh, yellow over there. Thank you. Thirdly, I'd like to remind all of you, if you're not aware, as you leave, uh, just a couple important notes. The, uh, there is a silent auction on the left-hand side as you walk out the doors. There is a document out there that I believe all of the potential candidates have signed. It is a picture of the Capitol that I think uh, would be a great memento for anybody who's interested for it. It's on your way out on the left-hand side. Uh, additionally, if you'd like more information about our foundation, we, you could either go to the website, which is americansprosperityfoundation.org, or we'd ask you to leave a business card at the front of the uh, event, and we'll be happy to get in touch with you as we follow up. Lastly, there is also a uh, poster which everybody will receive as you leave this evening, and it is a picture of all of the individuals who spoke tonight. Uh, we've asked some of the individuals to sign those. If you so chose to have that done, good luck getting to the candidates. <laughs> I mean potential candidates. <laughs> Lastly, I would ask Reverend Dion, if he's still in the room, to come back up and uh, close our evening on time. If he is not here, is there another reverend in the house? <laughs> Any other reverend? Herman Cain, can you come up and give us a closing statement, please, Mr. Cain? Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks for you being the creator of all things. We give thanks for this great nation, and we give thanks, O oh Lord, 
for life itself. We thank you for this fellowship on this evening. And we thank you, dear Master, for giving us the opportunity to be a part of the greatest country in the world. The Founding Fathers did their job. We pray for strength that we can be the Defending Fathers. This is our prayer, dear Lord. Amen. Thank you very much and have a good evening.